Right, hello and welcome everybody uh, to this panel on platforms, careers and entrepreneurship as part of Reshaping Work 2022. We are delighted to have you here with us and indeed delighted to be here with you this afternoon. My name is Lauren Rizavi and I work as a director at a company called Safety Wing, whose mission is to build a global social safety net, including borderless health insurance, pensions, income protection and visas. I'm also the author of a book called Global Natives, which looks at the past, present and potential of borderless work. I'll be the chair of today's session in which we'll look at some emerging issues in a rapidly changing world of work. And joining me, I have Sam Cow, Assistant Professor at the Stockholm School of Economics, Andrea Harmon, Professor of Sustainable Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Radboud University, Stefan Krofel, Global Head of Life Business Insights and Governance at Zurich Insurance, and Vincent, I apologize that I cannot do the French pronunciation of your name, Vincent uh, Huguet, CEO at the freelance consulting platform Malt. Each of my panelists is going to share an opening statement and then we'll move on to a group discussion. Before we get onto that, a reminder that if you're enjoying the insights and perspectives you hear during the panel, the Twitter hashtag for the conference is hashtag reshaping work 2020, sorry, 22, not 2022. And we encourage you to share. Without further ado, I'll call on Andrea to kick us off. Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, thank you very much for you to all be here at this rather late stage of the day already. Um, I think my opening statement centers very much around um, the topic and also the importance of highlighting that protection of gig workers has different dimensions. So we all have the same problem of these people working as freelancers not being in insured. But I think there is a risk to overlook that there are many different segments, sectors in the gig economy and in particular and what I'm most interested in, there is this online segment of gig workers using the computer to do their jobs, like programming, translation, design tasks. And why I'm particularly interested and why I do think we have or we do still not focus enough on this online gig economy is because it's the first truly global labor market. And as a consequence, it's a very competitive labor market. It's competitive because it's very transparent. So for the first time ever, a Dutch, say, programmer is really competing in real time against someone from Israel, Spain or Pakistan. And also because this market is strongly driven by gig demand. So there are many more workers offering their labor than requesters of work. So they can basically dictate the conditions. And then the question is, okay, so what do you do in this highly competitive international online gig economy about which, if I may say, we have still heard comparatively little today. Also today, I think we have focused mostly on on-site gigs. And I think the disappointing news is that there is comparatively little that a regulator can do. Why is this? Th the reason is basically because labor rights are enshrined in national labor law. So each gig worker is subject to the labor law of that country in which he or she does the online gig. And labor standards differ a lot. So therefore, it is very difficult to find common ground on how to protect gig workers. If you think about the international labor organization, then there are some standards of how labor should look like, but they're very minimal. There should not be um, child labor, there should not be forced labor, there should be some health and minimum health and standard um, uh, health and safety agreements for, for labor. But what we do see, if we want to go beyond, then we see a very heterogeneous understanding of what good, sustainable, decent work is. And already the differences between the United States and the rather minimum standards in terms of social security provision as compared to um, Western Europe are very striking. So what I'm really interested in is to try and see, so what can you do in this extremely competitive market that cannot really be regulated by national law, because as soon as you try to protect gig workers in one country, they will be le become less competitive towards the others. So I'm very interested in skills and also careers of gig workers and how you can provide them with the necessary resources if you want to, to be successful. And there I'm particularly looking together also with um, my team about um, what kind of skills gig workers need, what kind of skills are particularly requested, what kind of skills in specific areas can be fostered and, and how. So I think my core statement is let's be aware that the gig economy has many faces 
that the problems are very similar, but the way we can address them, we need to be aware that they also need to be addressed in a different manner. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andrea. And Vincent, I'll invite you to speak next. Well, not oh, Vincent. Stefan. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Um, also, warm welcome uh, from my side. Yeah. Um, uh, let let me. Um, comment specifically then um, on the social protection and um, on, on the insurance protection. So um, the transformation of the workplace and the rise of the gig economy um, raises serious questions about the um, financial protection of workers. Um, at Zurich uh, Insurance, we've worked together with um, Oxford University in a research um, collaboration that started in 2016 and went on um, until 2021. Uh, that was initially labeled income protection gaps and then um, uh, became a much wider piece of work that we called the future of work. And what we found is that there is um, significant gaps in the protection um, of workers, of all kinds of workers, and, and also in the retirement savings of all kinds of workers um, that are existing even without going into the uh, many additional challenges that the platform uh, economy brings along. Uh, maybe just briefly, what is an uh, income protection gap? The income protection gap is the difference between the household income if the main breadwinner is uh, working and earning that income and a situation where the uh, main breadwinner is not able to go to work any longer either uh, due to a, um, a permanent or temporary disability, uh, sickness, or even worse, um, in, in, in case that main breadwinner dies. And you can attach the, the question about adequate retirement savings e easily to, to that. Um, I'd also want to point out that the current economic climate, right with high inflation and increasing costs of living, um, is again, um, further um, uh, exacerbating that, that situation. Um, I also want to uh, make a comment on the role of the employer um, that a traditional employer would usually play in many markets, at least uh, in, in Europe. Um, there would be um, very frequently benefits that the employer provides with respect to protection of, um, of employees um, or also with respect back to uh, workplace uh, pensions and retirement savings. And uh, the role of the employer is not only to pay a part of the insurance premium or to make a financial contribution. The role of the employer also is to coordinate benefits across uh, potentially state-provided benefits, um, the employer-provided benefits, and potentially um, further benefits that individuals um, care for. Um, and it's the, the coordination and also an administrative or operational role where the employer, for instance, would then pay uh, premiums to an insurance company. So this is many, many things an, an employer does. And obviously the, the question is, once there is no traditional employer, um, who, who is doing this or how do things come together? Um, that challenge, uh, as I mentioned, is not necessarily unique to the platform uh, economy. Um, it's a challenge that you also have for the self-employed uh, sector more, more broadly. When it comes to that international topic that Andrea mentioned, um, I mean, as an insurance company, it is not only national laws and labor laws, it is tax laws, it is social security systems, and as an insurance company, it's, it is also insurance regulation. So if we were to provide uh, insurance benefits into that global labor market, we would need uh, basically licenses uh, in all different countries. Uh, in the EU, admittedly, um, the EU is of course um, a, a big help from, from that point of view where we have uh, common grounds, common regulation and freedom of services. But once we are leaving the EU, we would need uh, multiple uh, licenses and that's um, uh, very difficult to administer. Um, so, um, I already uh, ventured into what can we do as an, uh, as an insurance industry. As an insurance industry, um, we have identified these um, problems and also needs. And um, of course, we are uh, interested in providing uh, solutions and we can provide solutions, but we got to be mindful of the various challenges uh, and, and roadblocks um, that exist. Just a... Um, Finally, a 
brief comment on, on, on policymakers or an additional comment on policymakers. Um, again, in, in, in the EU, um, the EU is currently working on the retail investment uh, strategy, which has the potential to foster uh, retail investments in large or larger parts of the society. Uh, and, and we strongly support this initiative uh, as it can help to close um, uh, pension and protection gaps. And uh, the final comment is on financial uh, education. There is a study by um, Kant on financial uh, education in the um, European Union, uh, and it identifies um, a, a need to further improve on the financial education of, of the population. And that is one area, if you think about what can the individual, what could a platform worker do? First of all, they need to be um, aware of the protection gaps and of the, of the problems to be even in a position to look for an adequate solution. So it's, it's very worthwhile from our perspective uh, to invest into uh, financial literacy. Many important points raised there. We will now move on to Sam. Um, thank you, Laura. I very much appreciate being here and hearing all these diverse perspectives. I feel like I'm learning a lot. And uh, I'm going to stick to my script here. <laughs> and um, so um, thank you very much for gathering us here together to discuss the role that we, as individuals and communities, can play in shaping the future of platform economy. It takes many stakeholders, policymakers, companies, and consumers working together to ensure that platforms continue to provide income opportunities for the less well-off and more vulnerable population, and that these opportunities are safe, humane, and not exploitative. And I'm excited to join the other panelists in sort of discussing uh, careers in entrepreneurship. Um, over the past few years, digital platforms have created new business models and changed the economic value creation and capture in diverse ways. New forms of work emerge that are difficult to define with existing taxonomy. Currently, there are over 500 digital labor platforms in the EU area, and almost 30 million people conduct some form of work through the platforms. Um, platforms do not all have the same business model or operating model, and it's useful to acknowledge their differences. For example, many platforms are two-sided, but some are, have three or more sides. Ride-sharing platforms mainly organize within local districts, <coughs> but e-commerce marketplaces facilitate transactions uh, across long distances. An e-commerce seller can tap into markets uh, beyond their local district, but a taxi driver cannot. And a large part of the current rhetoric around regulating the gig economy focuses on how to curb the power of large platforms. But platforms op offer new opportunities for earning additional income. And those who take on these opportunities tend to have far worse job opportunities elsewhere or come from geographic areas where workers are generally pay less for the same sort of tasks uh, in their local labor markets. And perhaps to address the issues at the core, we need to realize that consumers and platform designers and investors who fund these business models should all be part of the conversation. And we're all very much responsible for these multifaceted problems that may not have a simple or a clear-cut solution. And it's helpful to recenter the discussion on the most vulnerable part of the platform economy, which are the workers and the self-employed individuals themselves. They're generating income through these platforms. The real question isn't, so how you uh, deprive uh, big platforms of that power, but really how can you give power back to the many individuals who rely on platforms as a source of income? And think of who bears the cost of regulation and whether the government should serve as a buffer in this transition. And for example, some of the current business models are not sustainable. I'm sure it's not really relevant to this panel here. I um, <laughs> just realized that um, sort of, um, uh, this is focusing more on, uh, you know, uh, individuals who are sort of otherwise have worse opportunities offline. And um, uh, so it, it may not be have an easy way around the problem, right? Regulation may have ripple effects that hurt both the platform and the workers. And workers who rely on platforms to earn income may lose their jobs. And without further addressing the core problems, which is unsustainable business models, the platform will always find a way to shift the cost to someone else or they will go out of business. And I just want to encourage another point of view, which I think is not discussed enough. Consumers and designers of platforms have an important part to play in contributing to either the problem or the solution. 
And while the platform company itself is often in the spotlight, consumers are fueling the currently unsustainable business models. For example, when people go to restaurants with their family, they're not only paying for the food, but they're also paying a premium for the ambience, the services, the culture, the history behind the food, even the possibility of running into old friends. But when you order food delivery, you're often doing so because you're too busy to go to the supermarket and you're willing to pay extra for a pleasurable experience, but you'd rather pay as little as possible to remove a nuisance from your life. But there is hope because again and again, we forget that we derive value from meaningful consumption experiences, which are sometimes subjective, but we're often willing to pay extra for them. So the good news might be that consumers are somewhat malleable and their choices are very much influenced by designs and incentives that are provided by the platforms. Suppose somehow platforms can be redesigned or there are new business models that provide value beyond cost minimization and efficiency. And consumers will be willing to pay more for them, uh, which lifts workers up and platforms can stay in business. And to conclude, I would just like to add to the conversation by suggesting that we put human values at the center of technological innovation. And by emphasizing the human value of work, we can find ways to maybe improve opportunities for both workers and for innovative platform businesses. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, I will call on Vincent. Yes, hello everyone, thanks for having me. So more than an opening statement, maybe I would like to share our story as a, as a marketplace. I, I prefer the world marketplace than, than platform, by the way. Maybe I'll explain why. And also what we know, uh, what we understand about freelancers and freelance consultants in, in Europe. So we started in France um, in 2013. Uh, I started the company with two ex-freelancers. And we started because we were seeing, so in France we had in 2008, 2009, the, the statue uh, auto-entrepreneur that let a lot of people chose to become freelancers. And more and more people, there were at the time probably something like 500,000 freelancers that chose that status. But they, ha they were having a problem. Uh, they were having troubles in finding clients because not everyone is a good sales. They were having problems in being paid, and particularly when they work with big corporates. And they were having problems also in uh, in some way in belonging in the community, okay, in knowing other freelancers and getting to know each other and exchanging things. So we started uh, uh, that business and also in response to, maybe you mentioned that type of platforms, uh, to more global platforms that basically, you know, I'm a big believer in how UX in platform impacts the business model and the type of community that you attract. And these platforms were really organized so that you have a race to the bottom, a, a race of price to the bottom. You put freelancers in competition between each other, and that was a problem that was not attracting the good freelancers in France to go to this type of platform. So what we did at the beginning is that basically we reversed how is the relationship. So the, and on Malt, the, the client is the one looking for the freelancers, the one pitching to the freelancer in some ways, and that made a very big difference because so local highly skilled freelancers that charge maybe 500, maybe sometimes 1,000 euro a day came to our platform, and then the type of companies that now makes most of our revenues, mid-sized, larger companies also came and joined us as a, as a community. So that's what we experienced and we started, as I said, in 2013 in France. Now we're in six markets uh, in Europe. Uh, we just launched here in, in Amsterdam. And we have 450,000 uh, freelancers uh, on one side, 50,000 uh, clients on the other side, and particularly, as I was saying, some big corporates using us. And we know, obviously, a lot of our friends, uh, about our freelancers because, as I said, at the beginning, we had this mission. We wanted people to belong. So we also uh, um, uh, do a lot of events with our freelancers. We take a lot of time with them, so we know them quite well. And we also survey them. We do that with the Boston Consulting Group now for the last two years. And we get a lot of learnings from who are these freelancers. And I think what strikes me particularly every year in this survey is the fact that um, more than 90% of these freelancers say, okay, I was an employee before and I chose to become a freelancer. And we ask them, okay, why did you become a freelancer? What was the main reason? And obviously, as you uh, might uh, understand, is uh, the freedom uh, of choice. Uh, so the freedom of choosing your clients, the freedom of choosing your projects, the freedom of choosing your, your price, uh, the freedom of choosing when you work, when you don't work, where you train, when you work. And that's something very important. And us as a platform, or better said marketplace, 
that's again what we try to do to help them to thrive in their business of freelancers. Wonderful. So thank you, uh, Vincent, and thank you to all of the panelists for their thought-provoking opening statements. We're going to move on to some questions now. Um, and we'll stick with you, Vincent, to start off. How do online platforms challenge the traditional notions of worker protections and other regulatory oversight? I think it would be really interesting to hear from you from that marketplace perspective on this. Yeah, uh, I think if I, if I see the... Um, what we, we have brought to them or what they tell us is um, that before, you know, again, there, there were freelancers before platforms, you know, which is a bit different maybe to go back a bit. I think we've been talking here a lot about the gig economy. I would like to differentiate, okay, on one side we have the gig economy, which is mostly blue colors. On the other side, we have the talent economy, which is white colors, which maybe have more choices, etc. But the, the talent economy was already there. You know, you had a lot of people working from going out from a communication agency and becoming a freelancer. And the fact that they're using now a marketplace like ours uh, help them in, again, like finding clients, uh, making, uh, getting some safety of payments. I think it's super important. That's one of the big problems when they, when they are alone, I would say. Um, um, but also uh, what we do is that uh, we have a partnership with uh, AXA, sorry it's not Zurich, uh, but um, uh, we've had that uh, since the beginning and we are, uh, have a, uh, a protection for all the projects that go through the platform. On top of that, uh, what we can do is, um, first, uh, what I was mentioning about, you know, unions, the history of unions were the capacity of people to get to know each other, you know, to, to talk between each other. So the fact that we are doing all these community events, I think, is very important. So we don't see ourselves as a, as a union, obviously, but we give them the possibility to share things and to assemble with other people. And then on top of that, uh, finally, we have obviously a partnership with uh, different insurance, depending on the country, uh, different banks. Um, where we don't earn money on that, but we get to this provider and then we say, okay, we have 400,000 uh, people. What, can of, what type of, um, of, um, of discount can you make for them? And when we hear and we, we survey the freelancers, I would say they're not so um, afraid uh, or so concerned. Maybe the, the main thing they tell us, and this is a topic that is not easy in most countries in Europe, is access to credit particularly if you want to buy an apartment or something like that, uh, it's very difficult, even if you have very good earnings, very difficult that you are trusted as an entrepreneur or as a freelancer, it's the same thing. Um, so that's, I would say, the, is the main topic. And then I would say that they have the possibility to find different you know, solutions like with insurance like Zurich, and et cetera, but sometimes they need more information. And so we see ourselves also the, uh, with our community team the obligation of informing them on what exists and what they should be uh, thinking of. Uh, with in mind, again, the, the fact that we have 400,000 freelancers and we are very different from platform where the workers make 99% of their revenue from one platform. In our case, it's a marketplace. So sometimes they work with us, sometimes they work directly with clients, sometimes we work with uh, staffing agencies, uh, sometimes we work with an IT consulting company. So they go from one thing to the other, so we cannot provide them something that will cover just 10% of their revenue time or their working time. So uh, I'm curious to understand, uh, to what extent uh, has your marketplace providing um, access to things like insurance? How much has that been directly informed by your users? And do you see that as part of your responsibility as a marketplace to sort of be looking after those things that perhaps are slipping through the cracks from governments a little bit? Yeah, they don't, they don't ask us as freelancers to, to do that, but I guess we, we haven't surveyed if they were happy that we are providing that, but, um, and we don't follow and we cannot track because we send them directly to these partners, so we don't exactly know for some of them, yes, a bit, if they have, you know, used it, uh, contracted it, uh, but we've seen it as the, uh, as the beginning as something we could do for them. Not so much as a responsibility because, again, they don't do 100% of their revenues with them. If 400,000 people will do 100% of their revenue, will be uh, a very big company, obviously. Um, but um, because we, f we, f we thought it was the right thing to do because we could go with Zurich or AXA or Allianz and make some deals with these people. So uh, same with banks, uh, same with uh, uh, trainings, learnings. Um, so we try to do this. We have a team um, which is uh, called community team. Uh, which is dedicated to this. So we have a, 
a local team in every country, in every market where we are in Europe, that organize these events, organize this communication towards these freelancers. So that's what we're trying to do to help them. Very interesting. And Stefan, do you perhaps have some thoughts um, on how online platforms are challenging the traditional notions of worker protections and other regulatory oversight? Um, yes, thanks, I do. Um, I just quickly uh, want to react to what um, Vincent, you were saying. Um, because one of your uh, statements in, in your initial, in your, in your opening uh, comment was something that we also found out in our work with Oxford, you know, why, why are uh, workers doing or moving uh, towards platform work? And we've actually found out the same thing you were mentioning. Um, most of them um, in our survey also did this voluntarily um, and in order to have that uh, in, in increased flexibility. Now, in in, in, in what respect is the traditional um, uh, social security model challenged? Um, it is, um, as, as I mentioned, basically, um, when you're working out of um, regular employment into self-employment, you're sort of leaving at least parts of the social security system, and in that way, uh, the model gets, uh, gets challenged. But also, um, you know, when... Um, uh, when Sharon was opening this this conference in in the morning, she's already um, very uh, elaborately uh, pointed out some some of the problems and issues. And um, but but I inevitably had in mind a um, let's say a um, platform providers. Um, I'm, I'm not saying marketplace providers for for a purpose. Platform providers that were basically maximizing their own their own profits without paying too much attention of, of other things. Um, what what Vincent, what you've described, what your model is, is what uh, I would call a <coughs> quite a responsible model. So when we um, when we think about what the solution can be, then I think the solution can be uh, to work with uh, marketplaces or platform providers that uh, assume the responsibilities for their employees and then we can find um, a solution for what is a, a complex problem. Um, so the trade-off that workers are facing is not just sort of um, um, uh, the, the freedom versus the benefits and the income, it's also that, that additional complexity and as I mentioned when I, when I um, talked about financial literacy, they need help, they need advice, they need support. Great if you're also um, uh, happy to contribute to that solution as, as, as a platform, but that's um, uh, very necessary to, to have a place where the workers find uh, advice. I'd love to come back to you on a point here. Uh, I think this point you make about education and financial literacy is an important one, but to what extent do you think it's an education challenge versus complex systems in the world today needing to become simpler to sort of reflect, uh, I suppose, the experience that you have as a consumer on different digital platforms that really simplify, for example, Uber with taxis or delivery with food delivery? Like, do you think that there are elements of I suppose, regulation uh, that need to change or sort of how, how stuff works essentially around work? I wouldn't go to the regulator first. I think um, certainly there, there is a point here that I would acknowledge about simplifying um, the world, uh, which is always a good thing um, to do. But I think it is really, um, uh, financial education, so really the education that's starting at young ages preferably um, that we are missing. So very simple concepts that many people would be familiar with like portfolio theory, compounded interest are not um, uh, are not familiar to many uh, to many people. So if and, and, and many people have an illusion when it comes to for instance retirement savings, right? So first of all what we see and what, what the insurance industry has proved in many places is, first of all, um, people underestimate the amount of money if you're talking about in a, a single amount of money that they would need um, uh, to finance a comfortable retirement um, because it gets um, relatively um, big quite easily. Um, but, um, you know, a half, half a million euros in, in savings don't necessarily give you a high annual 
uh, pension payment if you want to retire at age 65. Yeah? Um, as, as, as one example, and the other thing is that um, people underestimate the life expectancy, for instance, right? So th this is, it's not, it's not difficult to teach if you want, yeah? So you, you don't need to study for years to understand basic concepts, but they are not as widely known as they should be. Okay, I think we will move on to another question because uh, time is getting away from us uh, fast, as always happens on these panels. So there exists a significant divide between the experiences and freedoms of in-person workers versus internet-driven knowledge workers, as some of the opening statements already acknowledged. If we take the example of ride hailing and food delivery platforms, those working on the ground do not have the option to work remotely and they are often the lowest paid and worst off in terms of protections and benefits. So I'd love to hear from our panelists. What do you think are some possible solutions to reduce that divide? And specifically, does the new EU Commission directive seeking to define those currently considered freelancers as employees offer a path to better outcomes? And I'll come to you first, if that's all right, Sam. Sure. Um, I'll come, I give, give a shorter answer, I guess. So well, if you think about basic economics um, and the population is sort of selecting between different economic opportunities, whatever is available to them. So, so uh, the population that um, I'm trying to focus on is sort of different from these high-tech workers who have lots of options, job opportunities elsewhere, et cetera, but more people who tend to be unemployed, the most vulnerable people, and then they really, really respond to whatever is available, whether it's um, opportunities, food delivery, or other platform uh, availability, uh, available opportunity through the platform. So there's a whole, you know, a, a lot of research showing that outside options, how attractive your other opportunities are, that's outside your current job, how attractive those options are affect your current wage. So if you have more bargaining power, you have more outside options, you have better bar bargaining power, then you're, you're paid more. So uh, of course that I means sort of an economic phenomenon that when you have less opportunities because you're, you can't move and that um, you're sort of more likely to be the most vulnerable, you're paid uh, least. So there isn't really a simple solution to this. Maybe um, to one way is to have a, a, a sort of minimum wage um, to classify a particular category of worker, workers who um, have those characteristics and have a minimum wage uh, for, for them. Um, but indeed, there isn't sort of a very simple solution it's driven by economics, just what opportunities available to you uh, determines how, how much you're paid. Thank you very much. So I'll come to you next, Andrea. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts specifically on the EU Commission Directive that's upcoming. It's something you and I discussed uh, prior to the panel today. Do you think that this is going to be helpful, giving this new definition to categories of people who are currently considered freelancers as employees? Yeah, yes and no. So I do think that this new directive that possibly will be adopted is a signal towards platforms to take their responsibility seriously. And I think this brings us also partly back to your previous question of inequalities induced by platforms. And it re uh, reiterates with your answer, um, Sam, because indeed, the more skills you have, the more requested your skills are, the more bargaining power you have, the more you can resist to this competition. But importantly, also in the low skill segment, in the low, it is possible to kind of insure workers, to protect workers, to give them a voice if the platform is designed in that way. So this morning I was talking to a representative of the platform Zen Job, which just won an award on the Fair Work platform for being the best um, platform taking care of its talent. And they do rather low skill jobs. But still Zen Job um, takes um, yeah, let's say also the labor le regulation in the country seriously and offers different employment models so that workers, even at the low skill end, can be protected. And when I ta uh, hear you talking, Vincent, that this is exactly what you are also doing with your platform. So to some extent, it doesn't matter so much whether it's a low skill or whether it's a high skill segment, but it matters whether platforms want to take care of their talent. And if they don't, then I do think that it's up to the regulator to kind of signal that they have to. And this is why I do think it's important that this directive comes. At the same time, I do have doubts whether making pass pro toto more or less all employees or all gig workers working under a certain scheme 
employees will really help because you can possibly avoid the system or you also may not, you, you may take out flexibility of the market that is needed and desired. Hmm. Do you think a possible outcome could be fewer opportunities actually on those platforms um, a, as a result of it sort of being more costly and more expensive uh, for, for companies to employ people rather than contract them? Again, platform is not a platform, <laughs> so it, it very much depends on the platform. I think, yes, of course, as soon as you regulate, then the cost of the labor gets more expensive. And I do think, I, I have doubts whether in the current envisaged way this directive will work out. But again, I do think it's a str strong and good signal to platforms to take the responsibility seriously. Okay, I'm going to come back to you now, Stefan. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can kind of um, reduce the, the inequalities between uh, these uh, sort of these different um, income levels uh, within platform work? Uh, and, uh, sorry, reducing the divide and also the uh, EU Commission directive that we've just been discussing. Um, well, I think f first of all, right, that's that's a political choice that has been made in in, in that directive. Um, what I understand is um, the signalling um, effect that Andrea has mentioned that is uh, probably there. Um, I, I would say two, two things. What we've experienced in our work in the past is that it was actually difficult to link the topics of social protection and labor law um, because some of the responsible platforms that were actually keen to provide better protection to their workers um, were sort of hesitant to uh, provide more holistic, holistic protection schemes because um, they were afraid that that would be seen as a um, as a signal of them be, be acting like, like an employer and they didn't want to have that um, uh, out there. So um, that, that is one thing. The other thing is I think um, an, an Andrea alluded to when she said platform is not a platform and I would say um, even on the same platform there is different kinds of workers, right? Not, I, I think implicitly um, at, at least um, I, I often find myself assuming that a platform worker would do this specific platform work as the source of the or main source of a household income. That's not necessarily um, the case, right? So first of all, a platform, a worker could work on multiple platforms, and Vincent has has described this. Um, but there could also be uh, people assuming platform work in very different life circumstances, right? So it could be as a, a student uh, working some ex um, earning some extra money in addition to a student loan. It could also be on the uh, other, other end of the age scale, if you want, it could be a person that has already retired to just continue to be active in, in, in the labor markets. So there's, there's very different types of platform workers. So um, hence, I'd say um, I'd be doubtful that the EU directive is um, addressing all the problems that we are facing. It's not solving all the problems. It may solve uh, some of the problems and then be a contribution to um, narrowing this uh, inequality that you mentioned. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, so we are fast running out of time here. I'm hoping to fit in just, uh, just one more question before we close things off. So internet-driven remote work has the potential to flatten access to global knowledge work and encourage new forms of entrepreneurship, at least for those with technical skills and digital competencies. But even if work is remote, many roles are still only available to those who enjoy the right to work in a given jurisdiction already. This results in systemic inequalities between those with and without powerful passports. Um, I'm going to come back to you again, Andrea, here um, with my question, which is, how can we overcome the inequalities between people originating from different countries? Is it a matter of encouraging better business practices, the necessity of new products and services to ease that transition, or of policymakers needing to update how work and entrepreneurship is regulated to reflect new realities? I think we should first hear the, the practice and then the theory about it. So can I pass the question on to <laughs> our practitioners? Because I wonder, so I, I see this question partly as a question of, <laughs> 
making places more livable or giving better work opportunities in countries where you don't have them rather than regulating the business environment and then it's more a question of yeah how do you create job opportunities rather than giving access to what you say powerful passports so maybe it's better if if we first hear from the practitioners what you think and then i i can lend some theoretical uh, contribution to that sure um would you like to say sure. something no absolutely um and ag again i i think there is some uh, positive signs you know when when we talk to um uh, customers and partners now I have both in mind uh, traditional employers so say large multinational uh, companies or multinational companies um, but also uh, platforms who have approached us um, clearly with a vision in mind um, to design um, fair and say equitable employee benefits across countries obviously that fair and equitable would be in relation to a local salary or a local uh, standard of living. But clearly we are having discussions about how, how do we make sure a, an employee in country X gets treated um, appropriately or similar to a, an employee in, in country Y. So this is happening. So similar to what said earlier on about responsible platforms who were uh, embracing the idea of providing protection, we have the same here. We have uh, responsible employers slash platforms who want to tackle that very question. So it is existing. It's obviously not solving um, the whole problem, which is a very big and complicated one at once, but it's a step in the right direction. Excellent. And can I come to you, Vincent? Um, yeah. Um, maybe on that topic of remote work to give a testimony on how we've been seeing it uh, in our company. So we are we, we now worked a uh, remote first company, you know, we started in 2013, we now 600 employees, but also seeing how freelancers are working because I've, he I've heard, you know, these uh, digital nomadism concepts, you know, for years and, and I haven't seen it thriving. And I think uh, honestly now what we, we keep seeing and obviously things have changed a bit after COVID, but that it's a good thing that people can work remote again, that they can have this capacity of choice. And sometimes I go to the office, sometimes uh, I go, I work from home. But still, um, I think that the future of work is hybrid. Uh, I mean, we need to meet, so that's what we are doing today. Uh, we need to see our colleagues, etc. We need to work in teams. We're not just, I, I see a developer designer, not as just someone, you know, doing tasks, you know, behind a computer. They're, they're, they're creative class, they're working with, with teams. So. I think they, what we are seeing with our clients, what we are seeing with freelancers, that they need you know, to, to, to group and to, to work together. So I'm quite positive on this, meaning that um, I think we have gained freedom you know, on the capacity of working sometimes from home, sometimes from remote country, etc. But still, you know, we need that, yeah, that, that human you know, connection. So, um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a positive thing for employees and particularly for independent workers. A lot of workers, obviously, before we had clients in, I don't know, Paris, and we had workers in Lille, and the, the client would tell us, no, Lille is too far. And I would say, okay, it's one hour train. Maybe they can work from home uh, three days a week, and two days they can work at, at your office. And they will say no. And now this mindset has changed, so this is very good. But I think on the other side, I don't see everyone, like all the white collars people from Amsterdam moving to Bali. I, I, would, be, I would think it would be horrible for Bali and it would be horrible for Amsterdam. So, <laughs> so, so no, I think things, uh, things are changing, of course, but things have not changed, uh, don't change radically either. So, so I think we'll find an equilibrium. So we could do an entire other panel on a number of things that you've just <laughs> said, given that I've been a digital nomad for 10 years and uh, my company's primary target audience uh, is digital nomads. Um, but perhaps I'll just send you all a link to a white paper to get up to speed on that after uh, today's session. Uh, but Sam, do you have something to, um, to say on this point um, about kind of flattening access to, to global work, uh, encouraging new forms of entrepreneurship? Yeah, sure. Echoing uh, Vincent's point and then also to Andrea's, uh, sort of linking back to academic theory, I think the existing research um, shows that um, digital affordances can flatten the global knowledge curve somewhat, but it doesn't flatten it completely. So the local context still matters a lot for conducting work. And that's um, maybe also a little bit related to when um, businesses try to internationalize, they need to co collaborate with local experts, but that's not really a platform. Uh, sort of, 
research. So, and I think Andrea might have more to add in terms of academic research on this subject. Um, now that, I we'll do. Come back so to you. <laughs> <laughs> something to respond to now. <laughs> no, no, because I, what what I what I comes out also of of these answers is that in the very end, it's still the the, the locality that matters for the opportunities that you have as an on-location worker or uh, even in independent or also independent employment and also in terms of your social protection even in the gig economy. So I do think, as, as also Vincent said, we cannot erase locality, also not in the online gig economy, and I think this even more stresses the importance and the responsibility that platforms have and the same platform for the same product in different countries to kind of see also to adjust to the kind of institutional environment that you have there in place. Okay, uh, I think we can squeeze in just one more uh, question to close things off here. Um, and I will start with you and we'll go across. My uh, closing question for each of you is, uh, how can we ensure the innovation potential of a rapidly changing world of work is sustainable for everybody globally? A very big question. Thank you. <laughs> what is I, I do think um, I have been interviewed over lunch uh, on exactly the question of sustainable and fair work. And my answer is that what is the notion of sustainable work differs a lot between economies. So if you ask a US American whether a dependent employee wants to be health insured, often they say, no, I do not want to pay extra. So, you know, you have in the United States, even in Western developed economies, a very different understanding of what sustainable work is than, for example, in continental European uh, economies. And I, I do think this brings me back to the previous point that there is diversity and diversity is beautiful. So we do also need to, we, technology and the gig economy will not make us all alike, but it will keep us diverse and we need to listen to what also the social preferences for sustainable work are in a specific place to kind of make it work. Fantastic. Stefan, do you have a, a f some thoughts on this? Well, if, if you want like a hard um, uh, or a clear uh, answer, we'd say, well, well, the minimum level of social protection and also financial literacy, that would be like the two, two topics, but more uh, if I were to comment also more a bit on, on, on the process side, um, I, I think that's um, a topic that requires multiple stakeholders to work together. This is also why we've come together, I think, um, in, in, in this conference. And um, those stakeholders that are um, acknowledging the joint um, responsibility that we all have, uh, bring them together um, uh, and, and, and support each other in making this happen. Fantastic. I'll come to you, Sam. Um, I would say first returning to the human-centric uh, work and having more uh, innovative business models that are responsible, like your companies, and um, also uh, having more public-private collaboration rather than simply one-sided regulation. Um, and then another thing which I want to say, because it might be a little bit not talked about uh, a lot, is the consumer side. And if we could really, I mean, if we design something that could appeal to consumers in a way they're willing to pay a premium for you, then it benefits everyone. So consumers also play an important part in this, that um, you know, it's, it's sort of not really talked about in, in, this, in this conference in general. So. Um, I'd say that, so there are, there's in Europe six billion freelance consultants, and it's growing very fast. And I think it's a positive news. I think that people, you know, make this type of choice. Uh, we have to, to help them uh, to, to, to do that. We have to acknowledge also that they will be freelancers for or independent worker for a while. Maybe they become after that employee. Maybe they do that both at the same time. So obviously we need to evolve, you know, our governments need to evolve in understanding that, that people, you know, will move with these constant choices and that the rule is not just one uh, way. And, and if we manage to do that, I think it's a big opportunity for Europe. Wonderful. And so with that, I'm going to bring today's session to a close. Thank you once again to our wonderful panelists. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here with us. If I can find uh, the last bit, I meant to tell you some things about what happens next. Um, so from here, please head straight to the main hall where there'll be the final keynote and closing remarks for the conference. I hope you enjoy the rest of it. <laughs>